camcorder here. An overview of marketing. So, normally I break you up into groups at the beginning and ask you to get into groups, and we'll do that maybe at the end of class or at the beginning of the next class. But let's talk about marketing in general. And to do that, let's start with a discussion of art and science. What is an art? Something creative. Something creative. Okay. Is science creative? Science is creative. Okay. How is science creative? It creates things. Like what? Cell phones? Okay, there's a whole lot of science in this, right? There's more computing power in this device than there was, what, 1960? Right? Is it science? Science created it. Science created it. And it's creative, okay? What makes something a science? Measurable and verifiable, okay? In order to verify it, what does it mean that it has to be able to? Testable. Testable, okay? Which means that you can, you can repeat it and you can do what? You can refute a hypothesis, right? Can you do that with art? No. No? Maybe you can criticize something, but you can't really say it. Art is more subjective than science. Science is objective. We can test hypotheses. We can refute hypotheses, right? We can start out with a hypothesis, all cows eat grass, right? And what are we going to do? To test that hypothesis. We're going to go out and look at a bunch of cows, right? We find a cow that doesn't eat grass, what have we done? We repeated the hypothesis. Right. We found, we found that the hypothesis doesn't necessarily hold true. What about art? What makes something an art? It's what you just consider an art. It's just what you consider to be art. More opinion-based. It's opinion-based. Elvis on black velvet. Is that art? Could be to some people. <laughs> to some people. It's what? Depends on your taste. Okay. What else is art? Expression. Communication. Okay. So is marketing an art or a science? But how can something be both? You just told me that art is subjective, right? It's in the eye of the beholder. It depends. Some people consider Elvis on black velvet to be art. I don't. Well, marketing is, it's, I mean, it's subjective. And you're trying to get certain people to have a, get, have a certain opinion. But it's also scientific. I mean, you're using this task to figure out, OK, is this marketing working, you know, how successful is my marketing? So you have to look at it both because it really is both. Okay. You know, it's subjective and you got to pick what you think is going to reach the most people. But then it's also science because you, you know, have to look and analyze, did that reach the most people I want to reach? Okay. All right. So marketing is both an art and a science, yes? Well, they say uh, marketing is a science, but she's an art. You can look very different to day. Okay, all right, so it is the scientific application of an art to reach people and get them to buy our stuff, okay? Until the 17th century, there wasn't a distinction largely made between arts and sciences, and to this day, it's still blurry, right? We talk about the medical arts. Is medicine an art? When you go to your doctor, do you hope it's more science than art? Yeah. If I'm getting surgery and they're checking me up, I want to know a lot about science. Okay. 
But you don't make advances without trying new things. All right. Art more okay. Um, so marketing is both an art and a science. It turns out that after the 17th century, we start to distinguish between art and science a lot more than we did prior to that point in time. Right? We start to say science is refutable, art is not. It's not just a skill set that you can develop, right? You can learn how to paint something, and that's a skill, but whether or not that representation is good or bad is a subjective thing that we can't really refute. Although it turns out that maybe they're starting to merge in the postmodern era more than we think. Because one of the things that we're now experiencing in a subfield of philosophy called aesthetics is this idea that beauty may not be in the eye of the beholder. And there are several ways that we can test this. They go around and they ask people, for example, to draw their ideal scene. And over and over and over again, amongst all different kinds of people in all different societies and all different places on earth, they come up with similar scenes of what is ideal. It tends to be a pastoral scene with a landscape and some vegetation, water, a rise in the sky, things like that. And so maybe we're seeing a more and more scientific application of even things that we thought were very artistic. So marketing is both a science and an art. It is possible, even though marketing is a science, for businesses to fail, and lots of businesses do fail, right? Because we cannot predict in, in human sciences, right, or the social sciences, absolute accuracy among everything. And, and take into account all of the different variables that go into why people buy things. And so we'll talk a lot about that throughout this semester. So it's both an art and a science. Now, as an art and a science, right, what do we do with regard to a science? When we decide something is a scientific pursuit, worthy of study, what is it that we're going to do? Observe, test. Okay, but before we start observing, okay, we observe things, we start to notice that people like certain things, like what? One of the things that's great about this class that makes it different than any other class that you've taken on a college campus, I alluded to this the first day, is that you are already experts in it. Right? You have been exposed to marketing all of your life. How many of you walked into your first math class when you were a little kid in elementary school and knew anything about math, really? Not, you know, not much. You might know more and less, right, in kindergarten. You understand sort of more and less. But what else? Did you understand? Did you know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared? No. No. Right? But you know something about marketing. You've been exposed to it from a very early age. So as a science, one of the things that we have to do, once we decide that something is a science, is we have to define what is the domain of the science. Right? What is it? What makes marketing different than, say, physics as a science. Okay, absolutely. Physics has a, a much different domain than marketing, although physics has an application in marketing, right? This cell phone and what makes it work is part of the physical world. I watched a thing on the super collider last night on television, right? And finding out what makes sort of particles and matter, that's the grandest theory of, uh, out there. What holds all this stuff together, these subatomic particles? They are composed of subatomic particles. But it's a different domain than, than marketing. So what is marketing? Well, the, the definition of marketing and the domain of marketing is actually evolving because as a science, marketing is a relatively new Domain. The academic study of marketing really goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. Before that, you didn't have academic departments of marketing at colleges and universities. 
Colleges and universities were primarily engaged in the pursuit of other things. The stuff that they teach across the parking lot in the liberal arts. So marketing is a new, new discipline. The first departments of marketing were formed largely at the agricultural and mechanical schools. Harvard, of course, claims the first department of marketing, but they claim the first of everything. But a lot of the ancient, uh, in terms of the, the history of marketing thought now, uh, developed the agricultural and mechanical schools, particularly the University of Wisconsin and Purdue and places like that. And they, they came out of transportation and logistics and agricultural economics. And so you can see in this early definition, the first definition of marketing that we get is out of these schools. And it's a modification of a 1935 definition that had been proposed by the National Association of Marketing Teachers, which was the precursor to what we now call the American Marketing Association. And it says, marketing is the performance, you might want to know this for an exam, so you might want to write this down. Marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow <coughs> of goods and services from producers to consumers. I'll repeat that again. Marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producers to consumers. What do you all think of that definition of marketing? Based on the activity that I asked you about the first day, what did I ask you about the first day? How have you marketed yourself, specifically what? <laughs> Today. Does that activities that you came up with fall within that definition? It doesn't, right? Because what did you all come up with? How you dressed, right? Social media, things that didn't necessarily involve producers and consumers, it involved what? It involved you, it involved friendships, it involved all these other things. So that definition was really too limiting to define the scope of marketing because we're all engaged in marketing. We constantly do this. We're constantly marketing ourselves, right? So the definition evolves over time. Um, there are a number of other definitions that come out, one in the 1980s. Um, and what we end up with is the definition now that the American Marketing Association as given you in your textbook, if you look on page 4, five, marketing is defined as the set of organizational activities that provide goods and services and exchange of ideas for businesses, organizations, individuals, and society as a whole. I think this definition is better, the one that they give you in the textbook, but I think the AMA should take into account that this is a pervasive activity. This is a pervasive, so this is a test question. What is it that I think should be added to the definition of marketing? That it is a pervasive activity. You cannot escape it. We constantly do it. Whether we want to or not, we engage in marketing. Because we all need things, right? 
Aristotle says, man is by nature a social creature. Now, I don't think that this is something that we should, you know, get excited about, throw a party and go up in a balloon over. Because what else are social creatures? Ants, bees, the geese out here that we keep around, right? Actually, we don't. We just make it nice for them to stay. We provided a little ramp out of the pond for them. They come here and they have their babies every year. It's really, really nice, I think. How many of you like the geese? How many of you have been chased by the geese? Okay, a few of you. They, they're social creatures too, right? But what does this mean? We, what makes us survive? Marketing plays a role in that. Because are we the fastest creature on earth? No. Are we the strongest? No. Have the best eyesight? No. No. The best hearing? No. We need each other, right? But the smartest them. So are we the smartest? I don't know. That can be debated. They're doing tests that show dolphins are capable of abstract thought. Right? They used to say what distinguishes a, a human from animals? The use of tools. I don't know. Otters use tools, don't they? They use rocks to crush stuff. So we survive by somewhat to the, some extent to mar by marketing, by getting along with each other, by exchanging things that we need. I'm good at this, you're good at that. Let's, let's exchange. And so I think vital to this idea of marketing is this concept of exchange. Right? So even when you're not exchanging money for goods, you are exchanging something. In your friends, when you market yourself, what are you exchanging? In that, in that process. Social capital, good times, fun, right? Why do your friends hang out with you? Because you're a banana slug? You're boring? No. Why do they hang out with you? You're interesting, you're fun, you do fun things together, right? And so there's this exchange even there, even if, the, even if it's not tangible. So we've got this evolving definition of marketing. Um, now, what we see in this evolving definition of marketing is we see some distinct patterns emerge in terms of marketing thought and eras that we can look at. And the first of these is what we might call the production era of marketing, or the production philosophy. Now, marketing as a set of social activities is ancient. We can trace it back as far as we can find civilizations that have needed to come together and get along, right? You can even go back, I guess, in the anthropological record and say that once we started to form societies and we came out of the primitive psyche and started to form cohesive groups that we needed to market. But as an academic activity, again, it's a fairly new study beginning really at the, end, at the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century, when we start to see colleges expand uh, what we consider to be science. And what we see during this era, in the beginning of the 20th century, with the production philosophy, and for most of human history, you could see this kind of production mentality being applied to marketing, might be exemplified by a movie that many of you may not have seen because it's rather old now, called The Field of Dreams. How many of you have seen that movie? Okay, a few of you. What's the movie about? Baseball. Baseball. And who's the star of the movie? Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner. And what's he do? He builds a field. He builds a baseball field. And what's sort of the catchphrase that comes out of The Field of Dreams? If you build it, they will come. 
right? And for most of human history, this was sort of the, the mentality in marketing, maybe, is if you build it, they will come. Why is that? So production philosophy is, if I build something, people will buy it. Now, what we'll see is we'll talk about how these philosophies, although they correspond to a, an era, maybe, they are still very useful to some companies even today. I'll give you an example of a very high-tech company in just a minute that still uses, or did until very recently, what I consider to be a production philosophy of marketing. This, if you build it, they will come attitude. If I build something, you'll buy it. Now, why would that work in the past? No options, right. Very limited resources, very limited options, and if I have something, it's better than nothing, right? I think I told you all that I'm from Guthrie, Oklahoma. It's 15 miles up the road on I-35. How many of you are native Oklahomans? Okay, a majority of you. So from Oklahoma history, you know that Guthrie is what? It's the first capital of Oklahoma. It's the capital of Oklahoma Territory and the first state capital in Oklahoma until we lost the capital to Oklahoma City, right? As a result of the governor having an election and asking the people if they wanted to move the capital. The reason he had the election, by the way, was he got mad at the editor of the newspaper at the time, the State Capital Publishing Company was a guy named Frank Greer, and I actually own Frank Greer's home in Guthrie. So he was a Republican, and all of the uh, members of the legislature and the governor were Democrats at the time. It's a big flip-flop from today, whereas our governor and all the members of the legislature are what? Republicans, right? But Frank Greer was a Republican. All the governor and members of the legislature were Democrats. He wrote very unflattering things about them in the local newspaper. The governor said, retract it, or I will uh, watch grass grow in the streets of Guthrie. Frank Greer refused to retract his statements in the paper, and the governor held an election, and the capital got moved to Oklahoma City, right, by a vote of the people. And that was actually a famous case because in the enabling and organic legislation, for the state of Oklahoma, it said that the capital had to stay in Guthrie for a certain number of years, and we moved it before then, and a court case happened called Coyle versus Smith, in which the United States Supreme Court said every state enters the union on equal footing with all sister states, and to interfere in the internal workings of the state is not putting them on equal footing, and so then we got to move the capital to Oklahoma City. What does that do? Well, it's left this wonderful preserve in Guthrie, which is now the largest historic preserve in the nation. We have more buildings on the National Register of Historic Places than anything else, uh, than any place else in the United States. Some of those buildings are from the Victorian era, right? And you could actually buy some of them from the Sears and Roebuck catalog. This used to be a big deal. You can see these homes, they're called shotgun homes in Guthrie. We have about, I think, 35 of them still left. And they were called shotgun homes because you could stand on the front porch and shoot chickens in the backyard of your home with a shotgun without damaging the home because all of the doors from the front to the back opened in one direction and made a clear path through the house. And they did that so that you could have ventilation, right? The floor plan was designed because what did they not have in 1907 when Oklahoma became a state? Air conditioning, right? They didn't have air conditioning. So ventilation was a big deal. You could buy these homes again from Sears and Roebuck. There weren't a lot of variations in homes at that point in time. They were pretty simplistic. What are homes built like today? Can you shoot chickens in the backyard from the front porch without damaging the house in most homes? You'd have to be pretty creative to do it. Why? Nobody wants to build their house like that. What do you want your house to be like? Awesome. awesome. You want these large McMansions that they have all over Edmond, right? In the gated communities. 
You want something else. You're not going to do that. There's got to be more variety. But lots of homes were built this way at that point in time because it was better than the alternative. Sears and Roebuck came up with the better, you know, what was the alternative? No house, tents, sod, right? So if you build it, they will come. Ford, prime example. Ford becomes famous for what? The Model T. And you could get the Model T in any color that you wanted except what? As long as it was black. How many of you have a black car? Quite a few of you. How many of you would never have a black car? I will never have a black car. Why? It's Oklahoma and they're white. Hot. Right? I don't want a black car. That worked because it was better than the alternative. What was the alternative? Walking or horses? And horses are horribly what? Dirty, unreliable. Right? You have to feed them. They die. <laughs> I have horses. Right? Not an exactly efficient way of getting here to UCO. I don't ride my horse to town. It might take me a long time from Guthrie. But the Model T was better than that, and so it worked. This production philosophy. Can anybody think of a company that today you think still uses this production philosophy in, in their uh, outlook. Or Apple, absolutely. Until recently, Apple absolutely used this production mentality. Their attitude was, you don't know what you want. We're going to tell you what you want, right? And they've been somewhat successful at that. So this, this philosophy is still around, and we still see it uh, being used by companies even today. Uh, although we say it generally ends in about 1920. In 1920, what happens? So what happens to Ford that leads to them having to, and Henry Ford having to do other things besides the Model T? You can have it in any color you want besides, as long as the color is black. You can't have it in any other color besides black. What? What? He didn't want to change it. He didn't want to change it, but what happens is what forces Ford, does Ford just make Model Ts and black today? <laughs> No, there's lots of options. What, what forces that to happen? Competition. Competition, right? People start to see, wow, you can make money at this. This uh, Get rid of the horse and sell an automobile at a price point that people will accept. The Dodge Brothers come along, right? They start designing other stuff. And so then what you get is you get more competition, and we enter what we generally call the sales era. Now the focus is on making a sale and moving on to the next customer. Getting together, it's no longer good enough to just say, if you build it, they will come. You're going to have to go out there, and you're going to have to find customers, and you're going to have to sell them. And so what we see in this sales era is transactional marketing. Quid pro quo. I'll give you this if you give me your money. Right? But we've got to get a sales force out there. Now, for those of you who haven't decided on your major, the sales era is not what we teach in professional selling now, but for those of you who have not decided on your major and you're a general business major, you're going to want to listen to me. You may want to consider a career in our professional sales major. It is the only major on campus where we have 100% placement of our majors and minors and almost all of our majors and minors are making around, after a year out in the field, making around $100,000 a year. It's the only, those of you that are accountants, you're not going to make that if you're an accounting major, your first year out. But lots of our salespeople, lots of our sales students are actually making that kind of money, right? Um, and accounting is not the only fully integrated function of the firm. And you'll come see me. By the way, after you take intermediate, you'll, you'll come. Trust me. It's like the production era. I throw it out there, build it, and you guys come after you take an intermediate account. For some reason, I don't know what that is. I can't stay awake long enough. I don't know. Okay? Um, but this is not what we necessarily focus on in sales. But you still see this being used, the sales mentality, this idea that i got to make the sale and move on to the next one. i got to find lots of sales prospecting, going out, finding people, making sales, and moving on to the next sale, what we call transactional selling. Where do you see examples of transactional sales? 
sometimes in retail, although in retail we talk more about relationships now, how many of you, last semester, my favorite event of the school year occurred, it occurs in the fall, it's called the State Fair. How many of you like the State Fair? How many of you went to the great State Fair of Oklahoma this year? You should. It's a, I, go, I get a season pass every year. I go. I love it. It's great. But it's all transactional selling, right? All of the stuff in those buildings, they're doing what? Focusing on getting your attention, getting you to buy, and moving on to the next sale. Because what are they going to be at the end of the fair? Done and gone, right? To what? The next state fair or the next trade show or whatever, right? And they don't care. Um, this is sort of the Billy Mays. How many of you remember Billy Mays? Sold all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Sold the sham. Well, I guess the sham wow actually was the guy that came after Billy. Right? It was Billy Don. OxyClean. OxyClean, right? And of course, that's transactional selling. Because what are the chances that you're actually going to return it? Not very much, right? Because the item costs what? Very little. Is, it, is any of the stuff that Billy sold actually all that great? Anybody buy the stuff that Billy sold? I tried a lot of the stuff that Billy sold. I tried OxyClean. It actually works pretty well. But you know, he'd be out there like, you can get blood and grass and stuff like this. And can you get blood and grass on your clothes and get OxyClean to get it out? If you really work at, but you know, he made it sound like it was a miracle. You just swirl it around in the OxyClean for a few minutes and the blood comes right out. Mm. For those of you who have kids that play baseball and stuff like that, if you've ever tried to get blood, my brother uh, was much younger than I am, and you know, he played baseball and tried to get blood out of those white uh, pants after they've slid in somewhere and cut their knee. Didn't exactly work great. Right. Did I return the OxyClean? No, why not? It's not worth it, right? You know, for the price that it costs. Transactional sales. So focusing on getting the sale and moving on. That goes until uh, the 1920s, until uh, roughly about the 1960s. After that, what we get is we get the marketing era. And in the marketing era, what we do is we start saying we need to not focus on making mass-produced goods necessarily for a homogenous population, right, and assuming that people are all the same, we need to start making the customer part of it. Listening to the customer and focusing on what it is that they might want and need. So making the customer a part of this. Focusing on not just this mass production of stuff and then selling it, but actually listening to the customer beginning in the 1960s and, and listening to what it is that they want, right? Again, even during the 1960s, if we think back in time, were we a fairly homogenous population in the United States that you could sell mass-produced goods to? Yeah, even then we were. What about today? <coughs> Not as much. Why? We all want our own thing. We all want our own thing. We're far more what? Diverse. In the 1960s, the majority of Americans were what? They were white. They were Anglo, right? They live where? In the suburbs. What does the American population look like today? Texas is about to go minority majority. There's a catchy little bureaucratic phrase. Minority majority. What does it mean? It means that in Texas, in very, in very short order, the minorities will outnumber what has been the historic majority. Right? We have lots of people immigrating to this country. We have a lot of diversity, so it no longer works. So we're, we can't just necessarily engage in this idea of mass production selling for a homogenous population and then moving on. We've got to make the, the, the consumer part of it. We've now moved into, in a fourth era, what we call the relationship era of marketing, in which we recognize that it's no longer just good enough to ask the customer what they want and then make it, we actually have to focus on customer lifetime value. Keeping customers. Why? Because it's cheaper to keep a customer than it is to go out and prospect for new customers. So we have to build a relationship. 
with them. In this era, we have moved beyond even just the marketing era in terms of finding out that what people want to this idea of relationship building and this idea of something that I'll talk a lot about in here, value co-creation. It's something I try to engage in. I view myself as a service provider to you, and throughout the course of the semester, we will engage in value co-creation. That's why I structure the course in a certain way, so it's not just all lecture, so that you have an opportunity to participate and talk about those things that are interesting to you and your group. And through that dialogue, we can create value for the course, so that it's not just me lecturing. There's nothing more boring than lecturing. So we'll do a little bit of all of this sort of stuff to create value for you as the, as the consumer of what it is that I am providing here. And so we move into this value co-creation or relationship era of marketing. Now, having said that, what I want us to do is I want you to look at a video and figure out, and we'll work on this in your groups the first thing on Tuesday, and figure out how we can learn from this in marketing. statement up there. I started with that sentence about 12 years ago and I started in the context of developing countries. But you are sitting here from every corner of the world. So if you think of a map of your country, I think you realize that for every country on earth, you could draw little circles to say these are places where good teachers won't go. On top of that, those are the places from where trouble comes. So we have an ironic problem. Good teachers don't want to go to just those places where they're needed the most. I started in 1999 to try and address this problem with an experiment, which was a very simple experiment in New Delhi. I uh, basically embedded a computer into a wall of a slum in New Delhi. Um, the children barely went to school, they didn't know any English, they'd never seen a computer before, and uh, they didn't know what the internet was. I connected high-speed internet to it, it's about three feet off the ground, turned it on and left it there. After this, we noticed a couple of interesting things which you'll see, but I repeated this all over India and then through a large part of the world, and noticed that children will learn to do what they want to learn to do. This is the first experiment that we did. Eight-year-old boy on your right, teaching his student, a six-year-old girl, and he was teaching her how to browse. This boy here in the middle of central India, this is a Rajasthan village, where the children recorded their own music and then played it back to each other. And in the process, they enjoyed themselves thoroughly. They did all of this in four hours after seeing the computer for the first time. In another South Indian village, these uh, boys here had assembled a video camera and were trying to take the photograph of a bumblebee 
They downloaded it from Disney.com on one of these websites, 14 days after putting the computer in their village. So at the end of it, we concluded that groups of children can learn to use computers and the internet on their own, irrespective of who or where they were. At that point, I became a little more ambitious and decided to see what else could children do with a computer. We started off with an experiment in Hyderabad, India, where I gave a group of children, they spoke English with a very strong Telugu accent. I gave them a computer with a speech-to-text interface, which you now get free with Windows, and uh, asked them to speak into it. So when they spoke into it, uh, the computer typed out gibberish. So they said, oh, it doesn't understand anything of what we are saying. So I said, yeah, I'll leave it here for two months. Make yourself understood to the computer. So the children said, how do we do that? And I said, uh, well, I don't know. Actually. And, I, <laughs> and I left. <laughs> two months later, and this is now documented in the uh, Information Technology for International Development Journal, their accents had changed and were remarkably close to the neutral British accent in which I had trained the speech-to-text synthesizer. In other words, they were all speaking like James Tooley. <laughs> so you can, uh, they could do that on their own. After that, I started to experiment with various other things that they might learn to do on their own. Um, I got an interesting phone call once from Colombo, from the late Arthur C. Clarke, who said, I want to see what's going on. And he couldn't travel, so I went over there. He said two interesting things. A teacher that can be replaced by a machine should be. The second, <laughs> the second thing he said was that if children have interest, then education happens. And I was doing that in the field, so every time I would watch it and think of it. possible and uh, take it and definitely uh, help people because the children very quickly learn to navigate the web and find things which interest them. And when you've got interest, then you have education. I took the experiment to South Africa. This is a 15-year-old boy. She, this is I, I play games like this. Like animals, and I, I'm, I listen to music. And I asked him, uh, do you send emails? And he said yes, and they hop across the ocean. This is in Cambodia, rural Cambodia. A very silly arithmetic game, which no child would play inside the classroom or at home. They would you know, throw it back at you, they'd say this is very boring. If you leave it on the pavement, and if all the adults go away, then they will show off with each other about what they can do, which is what uh, these children are doing. So they're trying to multiply, I think. And all over India, at the end of about two years, children were beginning to Google their homework. As a result, the teachers reported tremendous improvements in their English. <laughs> you know, rapid improvements, all sorts of things. This is they've become really deep thinkers and so on and so forth. And, uh, and indeed, they had. I mean, if, if there's stuff on Google, why would you need to stuff it into your head? So at the end of the next four years, I decided that groups of children can navigate the internet to achieve educational objectives on their own. At that time, a large amount of money had come into Newcastle University um, to improve schooling in India. So Newcastle gave me a call. I said, I'll do it from Delhi. They said, there's no way you're going to handle a million pounds worth of uh, you know, university money um, uh, sitting in Delhi. So uh, in 2006, I bought myself a heavy overcoat and moved to Newcastle. <laughs> I wanted to test the limits of this system. The first experiment I did out of Newcastle was actually done in India, and I set myself an impossible target. Can Tamil-speaking 12-year-old children in a South Indian village teach themselves biotechnology in English on their own. And I thought, I'll test them, they'll get a zero, I'll give them material, I'll come back and test them, they'll get another zero, I'll go back and say, yes, we need teachers for certain things. I called in 26 children, they all came in there, I told them that there's some really difficult stuff on this computer, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't understand anything. Um, it's all in English, 
and uh, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> so I left them with it. I came back after two months and the 26 children marched in looking very, very quiet. I said, well, did you look at any of the stuff? I said, yes, we did. Did you understand anything? No, nothing. So I said, well, how long did you practice on it before you decided that you understood nothing? I said, we look at it every day. So I said, for two months you were looking at stuff you didn't understand. So a 12-year-old girl raises her hand and says, literally, Apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> Took me three years to publish that. It's just been published in the British Journal of Educational Technology. One of the referees who refereed the paper said, it's too good to be true which was not very nice. <laughs> well, one of the girls had taught herself to become the teacher. And then that's her over there. Remember, they don't study English. Well, she said, when I asked where is the neuron, and she says, the neuron, the neuron, and then she looked at this. <laughs> but her expression was not very nice. So, <laughs> so the scores had gone up from 0 to 30 percent, which is an educational impossibility under the circumstances. But 30 percent is not a pass. So I, I found that they had a friend, a local accountant, a, a young girl, and they played football with her. I asked that girl, would you teach them enough biotechnology to pass? And she said, how would I do that? I don't know the subject. I said, no, use the method of the grandmother. She said, what's that? I said, well, what you've got to do is stand behind them and admire them all the time. <laughs> Just say to them, that's cool, that's fantastic. What is that? Can you do that again? Can you show me some more? She did that for two months. The scores went up to 50, which is what the posh schools of New Delhi with a trained biotechnology teacher were getting. So I came back to Newcastle with these results and decided that there was something happening here that definitely was getting very serious. So having experimented in all sorts of remote places, I came to the most remote place that I could think of. <laughs> Across the river Tyne, 5,000 miles from Delhi, is the little town of Gateshead. In Gateshead, I took 32 children and I started to, to fine-tune the method. I made them into groups of four. I said, you make your own groups of four. Each group of four can use one computer and not four computers. Remember, from the whole of the world. You can exchange groups. You can walk across to another group if you don't like your group, etc. You can go to another group, peer over their shoulders, see what they're doing, come back to your own group, and claim it as your own work. And I explained to them that you know, a lot of scientific research is done using that method. <laughs> the children enthusiastically got up to me and said, now what do you want us to do? I, I gave them six GCSE questions. The first group, the best one, solved everything in 20 minutes. The worst, in 45. They used everything that they knew. News groups, Google, Wikipedia, Ask Jeeves, etc. The teacher said, is this deep learning? I said, well, let's try it. I'll come back after two months. We'll give them a paper test. No computers, no talking to each other, etc. The average score when I had done it with the computers and the groups was 76%. When I did the experiment, when I did the test after two months, the score was 76%. There was photographic recall inside the children. I suspect because they're discussing with each other. A single child in front of a single computer will not do that. I have further results which are almost unbelievable of scores which go up with time. Because their teachers say that after the session is over, the children continue to Google further. Here in Britain, I put out a call for British grandmothers after my Coupam experiment. Well, you know, with the, the very vigorous people, British grandmothers, 200 of them, 
volunteered immediately. The, the, the deal was that they would give me one hour of broadband time sitting at their homes one day in a week. So they did that. And over the last two years, over 600 hours of instruction has happened over Skype using what my students call the granny cloud. <laughs> granny cloud sits over there. I can beam them to whichever school I want to. You can't catch me. You can't. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Well done, baby. So we get. How about of the Hindus' cream? Back in Gates said. A 10 year old girl gets into the heart of Hinduism in 15 minutes. You know, stuff which I don't know anything about. <laughs> Two children watch a TED talk. They wanted to be footballers before. After watching eight TED talks, he wants to become Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> it's, it's pretty simple stuff. This is what I'm building now. They're called souls, self-organized learning environments. The furniture is designed so that children can sit in front of big, powerful screens, big broadband connections, but in groups. If they want, they can call the Danny Cloud. This is the soul in Newcastle. The mediator is from Pune, India. So how far can we go? One last little bit and I'll stop. I went to Turin in May. I sent all the teachers away from a group of 10-year-old students. I speak on the English, they speak on the Italian, so we had no way to communicate. I started writing English questions on the blackboard. The children looked at it and said, what? I said, well, do it. They typed it into Google, translated it into Italian, went back into Italian Google. Fifteen minutes later... <laughs> Next question, where is Calcutta? This one they took only 10 minutes. I tried a really hard one then. Who was Pythagoras and what did he do? There was silence for a while. Then they said you spelled it wrong. It's Pythagora. And then, in 20 minutes, the right angle triangles began to appear on the screen. It just sent shivers off my spine. These are 10 year olds.
and the group that comes up with the best answer to what it is we can learn from this uh, will, of course, win bonus points in the critical thinking challenge for the day. So um, go and think about that. If you, you've got about five minutes to remember who your groups were, you want to get with them, you're welcome to do that in here. And uh, I will see you all on Tuesday. I do want the consent form, yes. Yeah.